zombies. We all love a good piece of zombie media now, don't we? Whether it's a movie, a show, or most important to this video, a video game. I'm sure most of us here have some kind of fond memory attached to watching a zombie movie or playing some kind of zombie game. I mean, zombies just make very good bad guys in everything, really. They're mindless, have no allegiance to anything, and are easily killable. But then again, that last one depends on the piece of media that they're shown in. I mean, Call of Duty, The Last of Us, Resident Evil, some of the most famous and popular video game IPs of all time have dabbled with the dead. But there's one that I think stands tall amongst them, and that game is Left 4 Dead. A game series that was originally piloted by the minds over at Turtle Rock Studios who have recently released their Apollo and painfully average Back for Blood, which is a very blatantly inspired ripoff of Left 4 Dead. Not saying that Back for Blood is horrible, but if you compare the numbers on Steam, then well, it's pretty easy to see who the winner is here. Sometime during development, Turtle Rock was picked up by the incredibly influential Valve, and the rest is history, with Left 4 Dead releasing in October of 2008. Now, Left 4 Dead is good and all, but the sequel, aptly named Left 4 Dead 2, is better in just about every perceivable way, at least in my opinion. Even after only a year of development, it improves on just about every feature and mechanic of its predecessor, mainly because of the fact that it was given direct attention from Valve, rather than just being sort of a nifty side project. Not only does it let you play all of the original campaigns right from the main menu, the game also has full Steam Workshop support and just a ton of other new features on top of that. While Left 4 Dead 1 was good, Left 4 Dead 2 is just better, at least in my opinion. And for this video, I will be playing through every campaign, including the Left 4 Dead 1 campaigns, in Left 4 Dead 2, even if the game makes massive sweeping changes to the original intent of said maps. So if you're here for Left 4 Dead purism, then well, you've certainly come to the wrong place. Sure, some of the new features definitely break the original vision that Left 4 Dead 1 set out to achieve, but for the most part, the core ideas of the maps remain mostly unchanged. Some things have just been changed and swapped around due to player feedback, which is a good thing. I mean, I could sit here and talk about why 2 is better than 1, but we'd be here all day, so I'm just gonna move on. Oh, and I know I could have just played on the maps using the Left 4 Dead 1 mutator, and I uh, didn't because... Well, I didn't know that thing existed when writing this video, so, uh, yeah. Still, though, if you haven't played these games, which I strongly encourage you to do, then just go for the sequel. And when I said that I strongly encourage you to go play this game, I meant that. This game is, without a doubt, one of the finest video game experiences I have ever had. From its characters, to its gameplay, to its enemies, it is an incredibly well-polished and enjoyable zombie shooting romp, and for a relatively affordable entry price at that, too. Not only do you get all of Left 4 Dead 2's campaigns, but you also get the previously mentioned Left 4 Dead 1 campaigns tweaked and reworked with new guns and enemies. There's also Versus, a fantastic 4v4 multiplayer mode that is so in-depth and layered that it easily could have been its own game. You also have the game Steam Workshop, which is chock full of custom campaigns and maps that contain possibly hundreds, if not close to even thousands, of hours of entertainment. It is an incredibly good deal for an absolutely phenomenal game. And believe me, I'm absolutely going to spoil the hell out of this goddamn game. And if you care about that sort of thing, then just go play the game. You really owe it to yourself to do so. You really want this, huh? Alright then. Before I jump right into Left 4 Dead 1's first campaign, I should do a little bit of pre-game explanation here. For this entire video, I played on the Advanced difficulty, which is equivalent to most other games' hard difficulty. I figured that I had enough playtime under my belt to warrant this decision, thinking that it would be pretty easy to do even if I would be playing alone for my entire playthrough. I mean, you even have AI partners in playing single player. what's the worst thing that could happen? I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, this was a fucking horrible idea. But we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. For right now, let's just hop into the first campaign on our list, No Mercy. Welcome to the first campaign. We start on the rooftop where we can hear a helicopter passing overhead, telling any survivors who can hear the pilot's message to head to Mercy Hospital for extraction. And with no better plan, our ragtag group of survivors begin to head in that direction. And speaking of survivals, let's go over them right now. Let's start with Bill, who is basically the leader of the group. He served two eventful tours in Vietnam before suffering a nasty shrapnel wound in his knee which put him out of commission. A few days after the first infection, he was supposed to go under for a knee surgery. Unfortunately for him, one of the doctors in the room happened to be infected, and doing the most chadly thing out of any of the survivors, Bill manages to fight off his anesthesia for just long enough to kill the infected doctor. He then finds his way back home, donning his signature kit and starting his rampage against the undead horde. At least until he meets the other survivors. The next of which being Zoe. Before the infection, she was a film student studying at Aldridge University in Philadelphia. Oh, and from what I've read and seen, this is the first of the few campaigns that take place in Pennsylvania, so that's something. Anyways, back to Zoe. Judging by some of the dialogue in the Sacrifice comic that I've been pulling these screenshots from, her old man is a cop and her mom is... Well, her mom is just an asshole. Before this argument can really go anywhere, an infectee wanders into the house and bites her mom, causing her to become infected. She bites Zoe's father, and knowing that the infection is likely spread to him, Zoe is forced to shoot her own father. And I hate to spoil this now, but we'll later learn that this was wholly unnecessary. After Zoe, we have Lewis, who's my favorite survivor. Before everything went to shit, he was an office worker, and also a Team Fortress 2 player, judging by the heavy figurine on his desk. 
One of his co-workers is playing hooky from work, fearing the infection which is called the green flu in the game. Anyways, though, Lewis isn't exactly buying that shit, so he actually goes to work. He decides to take a bathroom break, and of course he gets jumped by an infected person while sitting on the toilet. Miraculously, he's able to fight his way out of that sticky situation and eventually meet up with the rest of the team. The last of our survivors is Francis, and he's my least favorite of this first group. He's not even really that bad of a character, he's just kind of not my favorite because I like everybody else more. Before the whole world went to shit due to the flu, he was about to bust it down sexual style with his girlfriend who just so happened to be infected. Thankfully, one of his other biker friends comes in and caps her ass, saving Francis. Then Francis and the rest of his biker buddies head up to the roof of the bar that they were in with a bag of guns and just start unloading on a horde of zombies below. It's not explicitly stated what actually happened to the rest of his buddies, but they did probably die, so that's a little unfortunate. And that's the gang. While I do have my gripes with some of these characters, mainly Francis, they all still have incredibly good chemistry with one another. For example, Lewis is basically the group's optimistic straight man, constantly believing in the group's capabilities and always believing that they'll make it out in one piece. We made it! I can't believe we made it! Son, we just crossed the street. Let's not throw a party till we're out of the city. Francis, on the other hand, is consistently pessimistic, always shutting down Lewis's optimistic outlook. He also has a running gag attached to him where he waxes poetic about how many things he hates, with a list of things that is incredibly long. But anyways, I've rambled on long enough about these characters, I should probably talk about the actual game now. Each of these campaigns that we play through is split up between chapters, with each one being front and back ended by a safe room where the survivors can resupply with ammunition and healing items. Most campaigns have at least four chapters, ending with some kind of huge explosive finale event which takes up the final chapter of that campaign. The first chapter of this campaign is The Apartments, and it's a mostly good introduction of the game's core mechanics. It starts off with you on a rooftop with a spread of goodies out in front of you. To start, we have the weapons. Every survivor starts with a pistol, which can be paired with another one for obvious benefits. But instead of taking two pistols, you could also take a melee weapon, melee weapons being a new feature added in Left 4 Dead 2. The melee weapons do vastly superior damage at the cost of being borderline overpowered, making the game very easy at times. There's also the Magnum, another new weapon from the sequel. It's basically a souped up pistol that does vastly superior damage at the cost of not being able to dual wield it. Already, even after just talking about one slot, we already have a level of risk versus reward in play. You could take a pair of normal pistols, which can be used effectively as a pocket SMG, or you could take a Magnum, which acts as an effective pocket DMR for people with a less powerful or shorter range primary. Or you could try your luck with some kind of melee weapon, which could be handy in a pinch but could leave you vulnerable to attack from some kind of dangerous foe. And speaking of dangerous foes, I really can't hold off on talking about these guys any longer. We have to talk about the special infected. If there's one thing that you'll likely remember, it's this sound. <coughs> The original game had five special infected types, with two of them being mini-bosses. The first, and likely most memorable of the original three, is the Hunter, the same little goon who makes that incredibly loud screech when he pounces. His main attack is that pounce, and if he manages to stick to landing, he can easily fuck you up, tearing your ass apart. The only way to get him off of you is to have one of your teammates come over and save your ass, either shoving him off of you or just putting him down for good. You might think that this would be bullshit, and to an extent, at least when playing solo on higher difficulties, it definitely is. The AI partners in this game can be... a little slow, to say the least often taking so long to find me that I ended up getting down before they could save me. But still, each special infected is still easily noticeable due to some very good choices on behalf of the developers. To start, they each have multiple audio cues, for example, the hunter. They also have various sounds that the infected themselves make, not only notifying you of when they're around, but also when they're about to attack. And this is only one out of six special infected cues. It is incredibly important to both you and your team's survival to get good at recognizing these cues and planning accordingly. Anyways, that's all for the hunter though. I want to quickly move through these things so I can talk about the actual game. The next one up on my hit list is the boomer, and he's by far and away the easiest one to spot in a crowd. Not only because of the fact that he probably has the most iconic musical cue, his main ability allows him to vomit his disgusting bile all over the survivors, seriously impeding their vision and mandating a break to wait for the screen to clear. But on top of that, the bile also attracts a horde of common infected to its victim. Thankfully, these guys are basically powerless at range, and can be easily dispatched with any weapon due to the fact that they only have a meager amount of health at 10 hit points. The final of the common specials, a bit of an oxymoron I know, is the smoker. I don't know why, but these guys are just the bane of my existence. Their main ability allows them to use their extended tongue as a sort of disgusting lasso which allows them to reel his victim in. The only way to be freed, or to free a survivor from the clutches of the smoker is by either bashing the person who's been ensnared or just flat out killing the bastard. The second option is easily the desirable outcome, since unless you were following a survivor that's been ensnared, you'll likely be unable to reach them before it's too late. Not to mention the fact that by merely freeing a survivor, you run the risk of the same thing happening again, as the smoker is often unable to drag the target away to itself, as it's usually camped out on a faraway window or rooftop somewhere, rather than, you know, being literally on top of the survivor like the hunter. 
still, if you do manage to spot one out in the wild, you can pretty easily kill them with just about any weapon in the game. Upon death, they produce a giant cloud of smoke which obscures visibility somewhat. Not nearly as detrimental as the boomer's bile, but annoying to say the least. Also, according to the wiki, you can slice the smoker's tongue with a bladed melee weapon like the fire axe if you're quick enough. It has to be possible, I mean there's an achievement for it, but I was unable to pull it off during my playthrough. Now, that was all the special effects that were included in Left 4 Dead 1, excluding the two bosses, but we'll get there when we get there. But remember, I'm playing the Left 4 Dead 2 re-releases of these campaigns, which adds in three new special infected into the mix, which I will also be going over right now. The first of the new specials is the Spitter, and she's our first exclusively female special infected. Not that that really means anything, but I just figured it was worth mentioning. As her name would suggest, she can spit out a glob of fiery green acid, which basically acts as area denial, as it will cause stacking damage to anyone that stands in it. Upon death, she'll also produce an entire puddle of the stuff around her corpse, which could be mildly annoying if she dies in the path of some objective. The next one on the list is the Jockey, and this one is probably the creepiest out of all of them. I don't know why, it's just... It's just that face, man. I mean, just ugh. His main gimmick is the ability to ride you around and fuck up your movement patterns. The game says that you can resist his movements, but I found this to be almost completely useless. Still, they can go down easily enough, though. They're also incredibly easy to pick out of a crowd due to their Dota 2 posture and their absolutely grotesque laughing that they admit. <laughs> And finally, we have the Charger, possibly the most dangerous of the common specials. As his name would imply, he charges at the survivor, grabbing them and slamming them into any given wall behind them, or sending them hurling off the side of a building in some cases. But if he does stop, he'll begin pounding the survivor into the ground, dealing just a fuck ton of damage. And due to his immense stature, you just can't be shoved off with a bash. Meaning that you'll actually have to kill the bastard to get him off of somebody. Combine this with an above average health pool and he is by far the most dangerous normal special infected. And those are all the special infected. I know I forgot about the boomette, which is just a female version of the boomer, and both of the boss enemies, but I digress. You might be wondering why I decided to go over all of these special infected instead of just staggering them throughout the video, and that's because of the fact that you'll likely encounter most of these guys within one or two chapters, as they spawn pretty frequently. Even by the end of Chapter 1, Campaign 1, me and the rest of the squad had already killed 7 infected total, and by the end of the campaign, we'd likely killed close to 100 of them. So if you do end up playing this game, and you should, you're probably going to meet all of these guys at least once within the first half an hour of your playtime. Anyways, back to the actual game. We kit ourselves out with some weaponry and a med kit, and we head downstairs into the apartments which themselves are full of common infected. I'd actually like to reconsider my statement about the common infected being relatively unassuming, because these guys can still wreck your shit. On this difficulty, I believe that they can take around 5 hit points off of you per swipe, so in large numbers these guys can be incredibly dangerous if not managed properly. And speaking of health, once you get hit once, that's it, you are completely incapable of getting back up to 100 health. A first aid kit will only restore about 80% of your lost health, and they are also incredibly rare, so you'll have to use them sparingly. But instead of healing with a first aid kit, you also could just heal with painkillers, which act as a temporary source of health. Each bottle will give you 50 points of temporary health, with the user losing 3 points every second, giving the user about 150 seconds of temporary health total. The second game also added the opportunity to pick up an adrenaline shot, which doesn't give you nearly as much health back, but they do give you a 15 second speed boost, which allows you to use your items faster and push through crowds of infected. Once we get out of the apartments and back out onto the street, we can reach a safe room where Bill accidentally tips off a witch. Luckily for us, I'm able to close the door to the safe room before she can get her way inside. The witch is the first of our mini bosses and is easily my favorite special infected in the entire game. She's more a test of careful movement and caution, a test that the AI seemed to fail 9 times out of 10. If a survivor is to actually startle the witch and draw her attention, then it becomes an immediate fight for survival. Despite her small frame, she is still incredibly formidable, having a ton of health and being able to down a survivor from full health in one swipe. Once the target is down, she'll continue to wail on them until she is either killed or the victim dies. She can also switch targets on the fly, as if a player lights them on fire with a molotov, she'll target them instead. Oh, and they're also apparently attracted to sugar. Keep that little factoid in the back of your head as it'll be important much, much later on in this video. Anyways, after we get done gearing up at the safe room, we can get into the next chapter, which is a subway, and it's another pretty decent one. As the name would suggest, it takes place mostly in this disheveled subway system. After clearing out the main subway and its tunnels, we can head to this generator room, where we have to flip the switch to open a shutter to get through this area. Flipping the switch will start the first of the game's many crescendo events, with the game spawning in hordes of infected while we have to defend an area. The game is nice enough to provide us with a minigun turret here, which certainly helps, but these sections can still easily cause a lot of trouble if you start one unprepared. Still though, this one is pretty easy due to the ample supplies that have been scattered around for the taking. After the shutter is finally raised, you can get back up to the street level where we can get into another safe room inside of a pawn shop, ending the second chapter. The next chapter is the sewers, and as the name would suggest, it's set primarily inside of a sewer. The first section is still set above ground where we have to raise a cargo lift to get to this warehouse, which calls in another horde of zombies. But eventually we make our way into the sewers, which, surprise surprise, are also full of infected. Since I haven't talked about the shooting in this game, I'm just going to take an opportunity to do so now. The shooting in this game is... 
serviceable. I am personally not a huge fan of Valve's signature crouch to become more accurate gimmick, but it's serviceable here since you're not going head to head against other people like in Counter Strike. In terms of weaponry, the game offers up a pretty wide spread of guns. I know I've already discussed the game's secondary weapons, but I still have yet to talk about the primaries. There's a decent variety, the usual suspects, assault rifles, some machine guns, shotguns, a couple snipers, and even a Counter-Strike source op? Yeah, when the game was released in Germany, the game was missing its incredibly detailed gore system due to German censorship laws. So to make up for this, Valve added in five weapons from Counter-Strike source. Those including the AWP, the Scout, the SG-552, the MP5, and the iconic CSS knife. The only of these weapons that are actually worth using are the 552 and the MP5. The MP5 is the best SMG in the game, and the 552 is basically an M16 but with the added benefit of a scope. The AWP and the Scout are garbage since they have an incredibly slow rate of fire and only deal marginally more damage than the base game semi-auto snipers. And the knife just has pitiful range when compared to other melee weapons. Anyways, back to the game. After we escape the sewers, we emerge out onto the street, miraculously in front of Mercy Hospital. Once we head inside, we can enter the third safe room and end the chapter. The next chapter is, unsurprisingly, the hospital, and this is where I believe the campaign peaks. The environment is nicely detailed, and it's also generally well-paced. This map's crescendo event involves us calling an elevator, which for some reason summons an entire horde. This fight is pretty fun, though, all things considered. It's incredibly hectic. But when the elevator finally arrives, we can take it all the way up to the 28th floor, which is still under construction. You might think that this would be a nice opportunity to breathe after that hectic fight waiting for the elevator, but the game had other ideas. Meet the tank, the true apex predator of the apocalypse. These guys are pretty much the complete opposite to the witch. They have a shitload of health and can dish out an obscene amount of punishment very quickly. They can beat the shit out of you, toss rocks, and even push around physics objects with instantly down any survivor they hit, which is a little bullshit since getting down from full health still drains your health bar upon being revived, but whatever. Still, these guys can easily wipe an entire squad of survivors if not dealt with properly. The best strat that I found was to start the fight off with a Molotov, which helps to deal a steady stream of damage over time. Then it's just a matter of unloading into the bastard. Eventually, they'll go down, and there's nothing more gratifying than seeing the animation of him falling over. After our encounter with the tank, we can reach the safe room, ending the chapter. The finale of this campaign spits us out onto the roof, which has been littered with supplies. The game prompts us to interact with this radio, and when we do, we can talk with the pilot all the way back from chapter 1. He says that he'd be able to come pick us up and extract, but we're still gonna need to hold out for at least around 10 minutes. He gives us time to prepare, and I take that opportunity to toss some gas cans around, which basically act as placeable Molotovs. The propane tanks that you also find are basically as portable explosive barrels, too. After I do a little bit of light preparation, I radio for the chopper, and he starts his journey over to the hospital. This summons several hordes of infected, including a fight with two tanks. Thankfully, I come prepared with a grenade launcher, which is one of the game's two power weapons. These are basically just primary weapons that can't have their ammo restored. The grenade launcher has 30 rounds in reserve with one in the chamber. As expected, it's good at taking out groups and dealing with special infected. I'd say it's decently effective at taking care of tanks, but you're likely to hit your teammates. At least the AI teammates, who stand right next to the fucking thing while fighting it most of the time. After a couple waves of infected in two tanks, the chopper finally arrives and we can escape. And by we, I mean everyone but Bill, because P got down on the roof and nobody went back for him. Overall, this campaign is pretty damn good. Now that I think about it, since I'm going to be playing all these, I might as well rank and review them. So I'm going to give this one a 4 out of 5. And for those wondering why I decided to go over all of the mechanics in the game in full right now, I figured that would be the most accurate to the average Left 4 Dead 2 experience, as you're likely to engage with most of these mechanics over the course of just one campaign. So I took the opportunity to talk about all the mechanics now so I can just focus on the actual campaigns from here on out. And speaking of the campaigns, the next one on the docket is Crash Course. And if that name isn't indicative of what happened after our short little helicopter ride, then I don't know it will be. Ah, here we are. Crash Course. As the name would imply, the helicopter ride that we found ourselves on was rather short-lived, as the pilot turned out to be infected. Miraculously, everyone manages to survive this incredibly nasty crash landing, and Bill even comes back from the dead to join us on our crusade. This campaign, unfortunately, is the shortest mainline campaign of the game, only encompassing two chapters. This is due to the fact that it was originally a DLC campaign for the first game, releasing for free on PC but for about 7 bucks on the Xbox. When the Cold Stream update came out for Left 4 Dead 2, this campaign, along with all the other Left 4 Dead 1 campaigns, is ported into Left 4 Dead 2. The first half of our two-chapter adventure is set in what the game calls the alleys. In reality, the first half of this campaign is spent wandering through the city's industrial center, with a real plan only being thought out sometime in the middle of our adventure. Our plan is to head to a nearby truck depot where we can hopefully find a truck in working order which will allow us to get out of the city and head for an extraction point in Riverside. But to get there, we have to carve a path through an army of the infected. The main crescendo event in this chapter involves us firing a mounted howitzer at a car pile up on this bridge. The sound of the howitzer firing attracts a couple of hordes, and thankfully the game is nice enough to place a mounted gun on the back of the truck with the howitzer trailer attached. After that, the walk to the safe room is pretty uneventful. 
The next chapter is the aforementioned truck depot, and at the start of this one I managed to find myself an incendiary ammo kit. As the name would suggest, this allows you to have one full magazine of incendiary ammo for your primary weapon, which is useful for obvious reasons. There's also explosive ammo kits, which are basically the same except they give you a magazine of explosive ammo rather than incendiary ammo. Again, useful for obvious reasons. After a while of wandering around these back alleys and relatively desolate city streets, we can arrive at the truck depot, which presents us with a nicely armored Dawn of the Dead truck. Unfortunately for us, the thing is perched upon an automotive lift, and to lower it we need to turn the power on. And obviously, turning on the power will cause the lift to begin lowering and create an absurd amount of noise in the process, attracting a horde of the infected, including a couple of tanks. Thankfully, the AI director was nice enough to spawn a box of laser sights, which are pretty much self-explanatory. They can be attached to your primary weapon and drastically lower the weapon's overall spread. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention the most important part of this game, the AI director. They're effectively this game's backbone. I mean, they control practically every single facet of gameplay. Things like healing items, enemy spawns, and even boss spawn points. I'm not nearly qualified enough to talk about this thing though, considering the fact that the information on the wiki is pretty unreliable from what I've heard. Still though, if you are curious, there are plenty of YouTube videos out there that explain its inner workings. But for all intents and purposes, they can easily be the most destructive boss in the game. A foe that can never truly be beaten, even when you're at your peak. Anyways though, back to Crash Course. Eventually, after several waves and two separate tank fights, the truck is finally lowered and the survivors pile into the back of the truck and drive away. All in all, this campaign was... fine. It's probably my least favorite in the entire game, merely due to how boring the first 75% of it is. Sure, the howitzer section is pretty fun, but that is virtually the only high point in the entire first chapter. The ending finale is fine, but I personally think it sticks around for too long. Whatever, even if this one is my least favorite, I'm still gonna give it a pretty terrible 2.5 out of 5. In the end, though, the survivors ride off into the night, only to miraculously lose their nice set of wheels and end up with a crashed car and a long walk ahead of them. Our next campaign starts off with a gang standing in front of a car that they crashed. A normal sedan at that. What happened to the cool truck and all of their gear is a mystery, but still, they've ended up well outside of their goal of Riverside. And with no other options, they decide to head out on foot. The first chapter is the turnpike, and it mainly sees us traversing across this destroyed bridge, and eventually into these tunnels that lead us back outside to the safe room, which allows us to get to the next chapter, the sewers. Oh, I'm sorry, I mean the drains. Yeah, it's, it's basically a fucking sewer. So far, that's two campaigns that have a dedicated sewer chapter. We'll see what the total is at the end of this video. I'm just kidding, we won't. Anyways, the crescendo event in this map involves us lowering this bridge to get deeper into the sewer. I, I mean the drains. At this point in the video, you may have noticed that I tend to favor the AK over the other primary weapons in the game, and that's for a good reason. When compared to the other automatic weapons in the class, it deals a staggering 58 damage per shot, which makes it capable of one-tapping any common infected and almost instantly killing any specials with a couple of well-placed shots. Compare that to the M16, which only does 33 damage per shot, but also has a faster fire rate, but that's besides the point. Sadly, to compensate for this, the AK only has a 40 round mag and has the worst accuracy out of all the rifles in the game. It's also quite rare too, which doesn't help. Still, expect to see this thing a whole lot during this video. After fleeing the godforsaken drains, we can get into the next safe room, which leads us into the church. The map doesn't start with the church, instead sending us through these train yards where I encounter the first tank of this campaign and nearely manages to squad wipe our asses. After we escape the train yard, we can follow this road, which eventually spits us out in front of the aforementioned church. Curiously, the power is still on, and when we get inside, we can find a safe room with some nut job trapped inside. He rambles on about being bit, which isn't exactly promising. In his delusions, he decides to ring the church bell to attract a horde, making us proof that we are immune. This kicks off this map's crescendo event, and I have to say, this one's actually pretty damn fun. After we slay the last of the infected, he opens the door, revealing that he finally turned. The special infected that he can be is always randomized, which is a nice little detail. Anyways, after we gear up, we can head to the next chapter, which is the town of Riverside itself. By the looks of it, the entire military rescue thing was a sham. The town has been hit pretty hard by the infection, at least judging by all the infected citizens roaming the streets. The way out of the church requires us to climb out of one of the upstairs windows, and I take the opportunity to put this nice vantage point to good use and get some easy sniping kills. After that, me and the rest of the gang carve a path through the infected townspeople before we have a scrape with another tank. Thankfully, this one goes much smoother as I'm able to light him up with a Molotov this time. After we kill him, we can exit out onto the street, where our path gets blocked by a bunch of rubble. The only way to get over it is to lower this forklift which allows the awning to fully collapse to form a ramp over the wall. Predictably, this starts another crescendo event that now requires us to fight our way to the safe room. This is easily the hardest crescendo event thus far, as we have to push our way through swarms of infected packed into this tiny ass alleyway. After being downed once, I only barely made it, clutching it on only 8 fucking health. Still cold over 200 infected though. Anyways, the next chapter is the boathouse finale, which once again doesn't actually start at the boathouse. Instead, we have to walk there. Along the way, I managed to encounter a wild tank which managed to down both Lewis and Bill before he died. Thankfully, the boathouse isn't far, and when we finally arrive, we can find a functioning radio inside. The guy on the other side says his name is John Slater, who anchored outside of Riverside in a small fishing boat with his wife Amanda. He offers to give us a ride out of there, claiming he'll be there in 10 minutes. 
I accept his offer, even if he seems a little too keen on us going along. Whatever, I'm sure he doesn't have any ulterior motives or anything. Anyways, this kicks off the finale, and this one goes off mostly hitchless. The usual challenges are on tap this time, several waves of infected broken up by two tank waves with one tank each. Boy, are you gonna wish when they all only had one tank. Still, this one is pretty easy. It's decently fun, even if it's almost identical to the wait in No Mercy. Only that time it was a chopper, now it's a boat. Still, after the designated time, they arrive on the boat and we extract without any problems. I thought ahead and parked the rest of the team at the dock where we'd be exiting from, so we could almost immediately leave as soon as the boat showed up. Anyways, that was Death Toll, and it was perfectly average. I thought the church fight was fun, but other than that, it was a very middle-of-the-road campaign, which is perfectly fine. Still, I'd say it warrants a 3.5 out of 5. Anyways, after we escape, John finally decides to show his real interest. He mainly wanted us to come aboard because he knew we were armed, and after managing to take our guns, he kicked us off the boat and left us for dead, leaving us in the city to fend for ourselves. Again. Alright, Campaign 4, Dead Air. Going into this, I remember enjoying this campaign, even though I've only really remembered the first half of this one chapter and the finale on the runway, but in reality, I would be in for one hell of a surprise later on during this playthrough. Anyways, after seeing a plane careening overhead, our survivors had to plan to head to the airport, hoping to find a plane and extract. The first chapter of this campaign is the greenhouse, and it's actually pretty good. I mean, we still spend most of the map fighting across the rooftops, not in a greenhouse, but that's besides the point. Eventually, though, we can reach a safe room that's located inside of this hotel. The next map is the crane, and this one, predictably, has a crane in it. I know, shocking. We needed to lower this dumpster with a ladder attached so we can climb upon another adjacent rooftop, but to do so, we need to start the crane, which unsurprisingly has a crescendo event attached to it. After clearing out the last of the infected who arrived during the crane sequence, I run into a tank, who is slain with relative ease. After that, we find our way into an office, which provides some decently enjoyable close quarters combat before we digs out onto the streets, and... I forgot to mention earlier, some maps have parked car traps that will summon hordes of the infected if you either shoot them or step on the car. After wiping out the horde that showed up due to the car alarm, we can reach the safe room, though. The next chapter is the construction site, and this one starts us off by spinning it out into its own namesake. We can't leave said construction site, as our progress is blocked by this large wooden barricade. However, there is a conveniently placed bundle of gas canisters right in front of said barricade, and it should be pretty obvious what we have to do next. Upon shooting the gas cans and lighting the wooden barricade, a crescendo event starts and we have to defend our position from a couple of hordes. This fight is actually pretty fun, even if the wood takes an entire dog year to fully burn down. Regardless, after the barricade collapses, we can exit out onto the street where Ryan's ended up encountering another tank. This one went significantly worse than the previous one, and that's all I'm gonna say. Thankfully, everyone except for Lewis managed to get out unscathed, which was nice. Unfortunately for me, no one had a medkit to spare, which means I had to hover to the safe room with 30 HP that would rapidly be ticking down. The pain didn't stop this since I got downed again, and if you manage to get down thrice in one chapter, then you're fucked. I only barely managed to scrape by and make it to the safe room, which leads us into the next map, the terminal. Unfortunately for me, this level is probably the toughest one yet. After exiting the safe room and clearing a path through some offices, we can come out into the baggage claim hall where we have to destroy this fence. To do so, we have to start this fucking van and then run it down that way. Why the survivors thought this would be the best idea is beyond me, but whatever. After that, we head through some back areas before we emerge out into this area where the chapter takes a pretty sharp turn for the worse. You see, the game makes you go through a metal detector here and forces you to start a gauntlet crescendo event, which is by far the hardest crescendo event in the entire game, requiring us to clear a path through some very narrow halls that just get packed full of the infected. This section made me restart the chapter like three times because I was just hit with a wall here. First time, Lewis died to a witch and then everything went to shit almost immediately thereafter. The third attempt didn't even let us get to the crescendo event because the AI survivors couldn't kill a fucking smoker that had me restrained. And finally, on attempt four, I managed to make it. And when I say I, I mean I. Everybody else died. Thank god everyone respawns in safe rooms or else I'd be fucked. Anyways, we've finally made it to the end, the runway finale, and this is easily the best part of the entire campaign. Not only because of the fact that we see a big ass plane crash at the start, but because this is just one memorable fight. Luckily for our four survivors, there is a functioning plane with an uninfected pilot, who is more than happy to get us out of there as long as we start fueling his plane. Starting the fueling process kicks off the first wave, as expected. Well, yes, in terms of gameplay, this is pretty standard at this point. I think it just gets elevated by the location it's set in. Still, after the requisite two tanks, the plane is finally full and we can escape. Overall, I still think this campaign was a pretty fun time. I feel like this one definitely had the highest highs and lowest lows out of all the campaigns we've reviewed thus far. Everything before the airport chapter was just fine, but the airport section just killed my enjoyment for this campaign, which was at least marginally won back by the good finale. Overall, I'm gonna give this one another 3.5 out of 5. It has its moments, sure, but I easily think that chapter 4 knocks it down by half a point. Anyways, on to the next campaign. The emergency band was talking about a military outpost just north of here. Yeah. So here we are, in the middle of fucking nowhere. Wait, how the hell did we get here? 
I mean, we were on the plane. You, you know what? I don't even give a shit at this point. I'm just gonna assume it's an evil dud cannon situation and move on. This campaign is set primarily in the woods of the Allegheny National Forest. This one is definitely a nice change of pace when compared to the previous campaign. I'd almost go as far as to say that this campaign feels a little cozy at times. At least if it weren't for all the infected meandering around, but I digress. Anyways, the first chapter is aptly named The Woods, and it's as expected almost entirely set in the forest. Frankly, this chapter is kind of boring, so I'm just going to skip ahead to where we arrive at the safe room located in this freight depot, which encompasses the next chapter, the tunnel. Most of this one is just a walk in what is effectively a straight line, which does lead to some shenanigans here and there, like the point where I had to carefully maneuver around the switch, and then all of my work got immediately devalued when Francis startled the witch and got downed. Then another horde of infected spawned on top of us and downed Zoe, which was actually her second down, so she would die if she got downed one more time. This just goes to show how quickly things can go wrong in this game. Thankfully, the safe room was relatively close by that point, so we could advance into the next chapter, the bridge. This is probably the hardest section in the entire campaign. You have to uncouple this train car, which will ram this bridge, creating a ramp that leads over this hill and then eventually allow you to get to the safe room. In the original game, you could just fight off a few hordes of enemies and then proceed to it as if it was a normal crescendo event. But here, the sequel changed it into a proper gauntlet crescendo event like the one in the airport. Thankfully, this time, I packed a pipe bomb which is a basic explosive ID with a nice little beeping alarm attached to it, which draws the infected's attention. A very useful tool in this situation since it can take the heat off of me and my team and give us a little breather. That window doesn't last for long, but after some trials and tribulations, everyone makes it safe and sound to the next safe room in one piece, allowing us to get to the next map, the train station. I ended up having to restart on my first attempt due to a cavalcade of disasters that involved a tank and a barn. The big bastard managed to wipe my entire team, outright killing Francis and Bill and downing Zoe and I. Thankfully, the next attempt went off much smoother. We encountered the tank outside of the warehouse rather than inside of the barn, which is certainly nice. Once we're done carving a path through the undead, though, we get another crescendo event dropped on us, which requires us to run across this bridge while being swarmed by the infected. This one isn't all too tough since the infected can only come from behind, which makes this one pretty easy, all things considered. After we're done stocking up with the safe room, we can begin our trek to the farmhouse, where we can hopefully extract. To get there, though, we have to go through this cornfield and... God damn it. Of course, the sound of the bloody crows causes a horde of infected to come waltzing on over. Eventually, though, after the debacle with the crows, we can reach this farmhouse where the actual finale takes place. Inside, there's a radio which allows us to contact the military, who seems surprised that anyone is actually still out there. He says that someone is being sent to come pick us up in 10 minutes, kicking off the holdout. Out of all the campaigns that we've played so far, this actually turned out to be my favorite finale. The cramped confines of the farmhouse lead to some pretty fun close quarters combat with the undead. Most of the walls in the upper floors are actually destructible too, leading to some pretty fun chaos. Overall, I really enjoyed this finale. I was unironically a little sad that it was over. But in the end, the military truck finally shows up and we hop in and get whisked away, ending the campaign with everyone intact. Overall, I really enjoyed this campaign. Apart from the debacle in the barn, I found this one to be quite well balanced, if a bit easy early on. I'd say this one warrants a 4 out of 5. Regardless, with our survivors now in the hands of the military, you'd think that'd be the end, right? Well, of course not, but before we can get into the meat and potatoes of that, we have to do a little story time here. I'm not planning on going too in-depth on the story of this comic, one, because it would spoil the ending of this campaign, and two, I encourage you all to go and read it yourselves. It's only about 170 pages long, so it really doesn't take that long to read. Then it's also completely free. If you don't want this thing spoiled, then I'll let you go and read it now. Still here? Anyways, though, when our four survivors hop off the train, they find themselves at the docks, which is the first chapter of this campaign. Even if it's only been about 30 seconds since we've started, you might have already been able to discern a surprisingly somber atmosphere from this map. The level itself is more of a bread and gun affair, with most of the map being rather spacious. This makes the entire chapter pretty easy, at least up until we get to this part where there's a crashed train. We have to open up this train car which will allow us to get through and over to the other side, the only problem being that the train car happens to be housing a tank. So we ready our weapons and prepare for a fight. I was lucky enough to snag a pipe bomb before this, which helped take care of a horde of common infected off of us for long enough to take care of the tank. The boss enemies aren't actually affected by the lure of the pipe bomb, but they still went down easily enough, even if Lewis managed to get downed. But still, after we head through this brick yard, we can arrive at the safe room in one piece, heading into the next chapter, the barge. This is the longest chapter in the campaign, and this one starts out with Zoe and Bill bickering about the plan. He's practically lost all faith in the military, which is understandable considering the things that happened during the sacrifice comic. Zoe, on the other hand, thinks that they need to stay and fight against the Horde. She believes that there might be other people out there, other carriers out there. Oh, and if you don't know what a carrier is, then well, uh, I don't know, I guess you should go read the comic, that's all I'm gonna say. Okay, fine, I guess I'll talk about it. You see, our survivors are what the game calls carriers. Despite the fact that they don't show any symptoms of infection, they are still technically infected, and can still infect other people. This would explain why all of our escorts have been getting infected and rapidly turning on the spot. We've been the ones infecting them. It also turns out that the carrier gene runs on the father's side, meaning that Zoe didn't actually have to shoot her father. So that's, uh, 
rather depressing. Personally, I can't exactly blame Bill on this one. The group has been through some grade A bullshit at this point. From the debacle with the Slaters to the events that happened at Millhaven, it's no wonder that he just wants to run off to the Keys and hide out for a while. Anyways though, back to the actual game. After escaping the brickyard, we can find our way into this truck stop place where I ended up having an impromptu encounter with a tank. This one went down much better. Thankfully, no one got down, and everyone managed to retain at least 70% of their health. After the tank fight, though, most of this chapter is just walking around through these boring-ass industrial buildings, which puts a bit of a damper on this campaign's overall decent pacing up until this point. Eventually, though, we can reach the final map of the Left 4 Dead 1 survivor's journey, the port. The main goal here is to start three generators that lower this bridge, allowing us to get to our boat. Each generator summons both a tank and a horde. At first, I thought starting them all at once would work fine, which it did not. The actually decent strategy is to take things nice and slow, killing each tank, then the accompanying wave of infected that show up. Rinse and repeat three times until the bridge finally lowers, allowing everyone to get on safely. At least in theory. Obviously something has to go terribly wrong, and the bridge stops mid-lift. So for those who decided to skip out on reading the Sacrifice comic, the ending is pretty somber, as Bill ends up sacrificing himself to turn on the generator, allowing everyone else to survive. Gameplay-wise, any player-controlled survivor can be the one to sacrifice themselves, but since I'm playing as Bill and I'm playing single-player, I really have no choice. In the end, I am left for dead, pun intended, as everyone else is safe and sound on the bridge. The ending of the comic shows what's left of the group sailing off into the sunset, fate unknown. We'll later learn that this ending was retconned, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Still, I think this campaign is pretty good. It's a surprisingly fitting send-off for the Left 4 Dead 1 survivors, and is actually pretty fun gameplay-wise. I think I'm gonna give this one the strongest rating I've given yet at a 4.5 out of 5. Making the total for the Left 4 Dead 1 campaigns 22 out of 30. Pretty damn good, even with my least favorite campaign being in this bunch. Anyways, I'm killing time here. After all, we still have another 6 campaigns to go. Sometime after the events of the sacrifice, we find ourselves following a new group of survivors in Savannah, Georgia. They've been trying to get up to the roof of the Vanna Hotel in order to board a helicopter to extract. Unfortunately for them, the final helicopter leaves just as they make it to the roof, leaving them stranded on the roof of a burning building. With no other real plan, the group decide to form an impromptu team and work their way out of the building. And speaking of that team, let's meet them now. First on our list is Coach. Nobody really knows his name, and he tells everyone to just call him Coach, and everyone just obliges. Before everything fell apart, he worked a relatively stable job as a high school football teacher. According to the lore, he also apparently played defensive lineman back in his college days, but he lost that position due to a nasty knee injury. Still, his background in teaching a high school football team make him a natural leader, and an invaluable member of the team. He's also just a pretty funny guy. Wait for official instruction. <laughs> Wait my ass. I mean, 90% of the Left 4 Dead memes are just based around him, it's kinda crazy. Anyways, our next new character is Ellis, who happens to be my favorite character in the entire series. He's the youngest of the group, and used to work as a mechanic before the apocalypse. He's easily the most reckless out of the group, seeing the apocalypse more as a fun adventure rather than a serious event. He often also shares stories about his friends, most notably Keith, who's been through some serious shit. Really, go and look at the list of stories Ellis can tell. This man has apparently suffered third-degree burns all over his body, twice. Still, he gets along with the rest of his team pretty well. Then we have Rochelle. She used to work as a low-level associate producer at a larger news station. Personality-wise, she's effectively the straight man, or straight woman, of the group. She's level-headed and often takes time to actually think things through. She's also usually the one to wrangle Ellis back into place when he begins to go off on tangents about his phantom friend Keith. Still, she gets along pretty well with her teammates. Unlike our last survivor, Nick. Not counting any of the characters in the Sacrifice comic, he's basically the only antagonist in the series. At least a human antagonist, that is. Nobody seems to know a damn thing about him. From what the official Valve bio says, he's a gambler, a con man, and tends to generally be up to no good. He often acts as the voice of doubt, and also patronizes his fellow survivors quite frequently. Especially Ellis. I mean, Nick is just a downright asshole on early maps, even if Ellis is incredibly cordial and friendly with him from when they first meet up to their final stand. Still, across the course of the game, he learns to work together with his group despite his demeanor in the beginning. In the end, though, the new group have good chemistry together and get along with one another quite well, with the exception of Nick at least. Anyways, back to the dead center. As expected, we start off on the roof of the hotel with only some medical kits, pistols, and a few melee weapons. Once we get inside the hotel, the place is crawling with infected, which shouldn't be all too surprising. In terms of gameplay, these areas are almost exclusively designed to get players accustomed to the newer special infected and other new mechanics. Things that I've spent the, I don't know, first 40 minutes of this video covering at this point. After carving a path through the infected on the top floors, at one point having to carefully navigate on the ledges outside of the building, we can reach an elevator and ride our way down to the lobby. The group get mildly acquainted by exchanging first names here, before the elevator begins to curiously fill the smoke. 
When the door is open, we can find ourselves confronted with a blaze of fire along with the flood of the infected. Still, we manage to make it to the safe room, mostly unscathed. The next chapter is the streets, and this is where things begin to heat up in this campaign. One thing that I haven't mentioned up until this point are the uncommon infected. They're not as rare or as dangerous as the specials, but they have a certain edge of the common infected. Case in point, the Sita hazmat zombies. As the name would suggest, they wear hazmat suits that for some reason protect them from fire damage. It doesn't stop bites, but it will make them fireproof for some reason. They also have a chance to drop what the game calls a bile bomb, which is our final grenade type of the game. And it was one that was added in Left 4 Dead 2. It's a jar of boomer bile that has the same effect that the boomer bile has when it hits a player, as it can lure the infected to anything that it's been thrown at for about 20 seconds. This can be insanely useful in certain circumstances. Frankly, I wish I used it more often, as I ended up using other throwables more often, only taking a bile bomb when it was the only thing available. Anyways, though, this chapter is pretty long, encompassing many different little sections, but the main focal point I'd say is this gun store. It's got one of just about every damn firearm in the game, a pack of laser sights, and a pile of four first aid kits. Despite the fact that I had the option to choose literally anything, I opted to go with Old Reliable. That being the AK with a nice laser sight attached to it, which makes this thing incredibly overpowered. We can also find an intercom where we can talk with the gun store's owner named Whitaker, who has a proposition for us. Basically, he wants us to go to the grocery store across the way and fetch him some cola. In return, he'll use the grenade launcher to blow up the fuel tanker blocking the road ahead. Why we didn't just walk around that is beyond me, but it seems like a pretty fair deal to me considering the fact that I've basically been strong-armed into it by Valve. So, I head on in, and of course, the doors trigger an alarm that summons a horde of the infected. Still, after a run through the jungle of the undead, we can deliver the cola to Whitaker. He's a little disappointed that we only managed to fetch him a six-pack, but being a man of his word, he still destroys the tanker blocking the way, wishing us a farewell on our way out. Eventually, after clearing a path through this parking lot, we can reach the safe room located in the mall, which should hopefully have an evacuation site in it. This chapter in the mall is easily the hardest section of the entire campaign, mainly because of the fact that it has another gauntlet crescendo event in it that requires us to run our way to an alarm panel that is directly in the path of the infected. Still managed to do it on my first time, but I only just barely managed to survive. I'm only really skipping past most of this chapter because the real meat and potatoes of the mall section is the finale. You see, there is no evac at the mall. The team that was there was fucking slaughtered, and now we're on our own. But there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. That light at the end of the tunnel being one Jimmy Games Jr., an ace race car driver who happened to be turning the mall during the outbreak, and he brought his famous stock car with him. The plan is now to fill the thing up with gas and drive our way out of there. Certainly no easy task considering the fact that these stock cars aren't filled up when they're on display, so we'll need at least eight full cans of gas to fill the damn thing up. This marks the first of our scavenge finales. We need to find and collect the eight aforementioned gas cans to fill up the car and trigger the escape. The game obviously spawns in hordes of infected in the process as well as a few tanks, but this section is still pretty easy, even if I ended up having to do all of the heavy lifting myself. But still, after topping off our tank, we can hop in the car and ride off into the sunset, with everyone managing to survive this campaign. Overall, I think this is a fantastic campaign, even if it is only four chapters. It's got a ton of fantastic sections, the cola run, the burning hotel, the stock car, it really is great fun. I think I'm going to award this one a 4.5 out of 5. Now that we're on the road, you'd think things would be pretty simple from here, but in reality, we're doing a run-in with some friendly faces. When we come back to our group, we find them standing next to the car at the end of this bridge. The same bridge that the original crew defended with their lives in the sacrifice. Surprisingly, they're still here, even if in the end of the Sacrifice comic it showed them riding off into the sunset. They say that the generator that Bill sacrificed himself to turn on is, unfortunately, out of gas. Francis says that we'll have to get around to the other side, fill up the generator, and then they'll lower the bridge for us, allowing us to drive across and continue our journey. The name The Passing is a rather fitting name for this campaign. It could be interpreted as the new survivors merely passing by the old ones in a strange sort of coincidence. On the other hand, the name could be symbolic of the old survivors passing the torch to the new ones, letting them carry the burden of continuing the fight. Anyways, back to the actual game. The Passing was released on April 22nd of 2010, nearly six months before the Sacrifice campaign and five months before its associated comic. The campaign starts off with a chapter called The Riverbank. Right off the bat, this is the easiest campaign yet, featuring many things to aid the player. Case in point, The Fallen Survivor, a new uncommon infected that is exclusive to this campaign. While they do have significantly more health than the rest of the infected, they also carry around a bunch of good stuff when they die. In the best case scenario, he can carry a pipe bomb, a bottle of pills, a molotov, and even an entire first aid kit. They are also extremely non-confrontational, running away from the player most of the time. After getting off the main street, we can arrive at this sort of back alley area where I ended up getting jumped by a tank. Thankfully, he was taken care of pretty easily and without any real trouble at that. Another thing exclusive to this campaign are footlockers. These have an infinite supply of anything from pain pills and adrenaline shots to pipe bombs and molotovs. An incredibly handy addition. After we get through this apartment block, we can emerge into this park. The infected here are curiously well-dressed, appearing as if they were dressed for some kind of wedding. And they were, judging by the witch sitting at the altar, alone. She basically acts as this map's crescendo event, even if she doesn't really have any statistical benefits over her non-bridal counterpart. 
Unsurprisingly, one of my teammates managed to startle her, which also calls in a horde of the infected to aid her. But after weathering the horde and rescuing Coach, we can finally make it to Chapter 2, which is called The Underground. This one starts off by sending us through some streets packed with the undead, eventually leading us to this bar which will spit us out into this construction site area that has been flooded by the torrential downpour of rain. That's another thing that is quite totally different from this campaign compared to the others. Compared to both the darker and dreary Left 4 Dead 1 campaigns and the more upbeat and almost lighthearted tone of the sequel campaigns, the passing is almost somewhere in between. At least in my opinion. Eventually, though, after making our way through the construction site, we can find our way into Rayford's Bar, which is advertising a tour of the supposedly historic underside of the river. Seeing this is a way to get across the river, the survivors decide to embark on the tour, which takes them through some underground tunnel areas before spitting them out in the sewer, where I have an impromptu duel with a tank, which goes relatively smooth. Yeah, Rochelle almost got bodied, but whatever. This is easily the hardest section in the entire campaign, requiring the survivors to run through a gauntlet of two different crescendo events back to back, with one of them funneling you through this tiny-ass flooded tunnel with waist-high water. You'd better have picked up a melee weapon before this because there's basically no way through it without one. But after making it to the light at the end of the tunnel, we can reach the safe room and arrive at the final chapter of the campaign, the port. This one has a similar premise to the finale of The Last Stand, but with the gameplay of Dead Center. Rather than just having three generators that need to be started at once, the generator needs ten gas cans to be completely full. Thankfully, the original crew, minus Bill, provide us covering fire, even tossing us helpful supplies like this M60 light machine gun, the game's other power weapon. It's got a 150 round belt, does damage on par with the AK with the only downside that it is A, can't be reloaded, and B, is extremely rare. This ended up being the only one I managed to find in my entire playthrough, and it was a special drop that had a laser sight on it. But eventually, after gathering the required gas, the survivors lower the bridge, allowing us to hub it back across, pop in our wheels, and escape. Overall, I actually liked this campaign quite a bit. The interactions between the new and the original cast were well executed, and it was nice to just see these guys again, even if I spent nearly half an hour talking about them before this. Overall, though, I'm still thinking a 3.5 out of 5. When we find our new cast once more, we find them in a sticky situation, though. With the car in shit shape and a 100 car pileup in front of them, it looks like their only option is to go on foot from here. Out of ideas, the team decides to head out on foot. With no real direction, they check it out. Hey, Guys, can I have a second with the car? Shit, I used to go there Alone. when I was a kid. Well, uh, the, the shit it looks like we're going to the Whispering Oaks amusement park, and uh, that's it. That's our entire plan. Is there some kind of extraction center of the park? No. Is there some kind of hint that they should even go there in the first place? Also, no. Yeah, the motivations for this one are kind of garbage, but this does lead to easily the most unique locale in the entire series, but first we actually have to get there. The first chapter is the highway, and this one starts out on a highway. After getting off the main road, we can end up at this motel, which is basically the main focal point of this map. Every time I replay this campaign, I always forget about this part. I only remember the first part and the ending at the creek. I also ended up running into a tank at the motel, which ended up downing Ellis. But after that, we can end up at the creek from before, which is pretty boring gameplay-wise, but once we get back up on a dry land, we can arrive at the theme park itself, and this is where the campaign picks up tenfold. The entire amusement park is incredibly detailed, head to toe, with most, if not all, of the assets used here being unique to this stretch of the game. There's also a couple of mini-games you can take part in. Case in point, the Shooting Gallery one. The Shooting Gallery itself is pretty fun, but if you manage to get 750 points, which is pretty easy, might I add, you can get the real icon of the game, Noam Chomsky. And yes, I know he was originally in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, but I don't care. This is easily his most famous appearance, mainly because of the fact that he's tied into an incredibly fun achievement. That achievement being Garden Gnome, which requires the survivor to carry this guy all the way through the campaign and carry him out of the finale as you escape. Now, I already have this achievement, but I figured it'd be a fun thing to do, you know, for the video. Little did I know, this would be a horrible, horrible, just awful idea. The last part of note in this chapter is its crescendo event, involving a carousel. Not really all that challenging, even with a gnome. You can still bash enemies with it, but you could always just drop it to deal with enemies, too. After the carousel section, we can reach the save room and enter to chapter 3, The Coaster. This is by far one of the hardest chapters in the game, probably in my top 3. And for those curious about that top 3, well, here it is. I know first place hasn't been filled out yet, but you'll see why in a bit. Regardless, the chapter doesn't actually start at the coaster, but instead starts at the Tunnel of Love, which is probably my least favorite part in the entire game. I mean, it looks nice, but I had to play this part like four goddamn times. You'll see why in a sec. Frankly, I'm just gonna save you and me a bunch of time here and skip past this entire part, and just head right into the real meat and potatoes of this map, the coaster itself. This part was just... soul-crushing. You have to turn on power for the coaster, which starts a gauntlet crescendo event that requires players to navigate the narrow lanes of the coaster and shut off the alarm. You could just run past everything and skip the alarm, but that wasn't exactly an option for me. Mainly because I didn't know you could do that until, like, after the playthrough, but that's besides the point. I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I died, like, four or five times. As soon as one of my teammates went down, everything went to pot immediately. 
on one attempt, I got so fucking close that I was literally within walking distance of the safe room. I mean, it's right there! But finally, after attempt four or five, I managed to make it to the safe room after me and my team just barely scraped by. In the end, the strat was to just stake with the rest of the team, toss the gnome here, run the gauntlet until you reach the gnome, pick up said gnome, and then make the run to the panel and then the safe room. That's what ended up doing it for me, but your results may vary. God, this gnome thing was just a giant waste of time. I guess it is mildly entertaining, though. Anyways, the next chapter is the barns, and as expected, it has some barns in it. Not at first, though. We have to go through a bumper car arena before we can end up spotting a chopper, which the crew decided to try and flag down for an escape. The rest of the chapter, including the section of the barns, is kind of boring, so I'm just gonna skip to the final gauntlet where this map really ramps up. The final crescendo event of this chapter is an absolute beast. It starts when we open the turnstile gates, which trigger a crescendo event that won't end until we reach the safe room. Said safe room is at the end of this narrow-ass pathway that fills with the infected really quickly. It would have been smart to pack a bile bomb, but I ended up packing a pipe bomb instead, which was still pretty handy, but not nearly as useful in this area. I'd still say that the coaster was harder, but this part can be a pain in the ass. I still ended up dying once, but on my second attempt, I managed to make it to the safe room. The finale of this campaign is the concert, and it's my favorite in the entire game. You see, back in Chapter 2, the safe room had a poster advertising a concert for the Midnight Riders, which is finally coming back into play here. You see, the team decided to use the concert's pyrotechnics to signal the chopper. This will obviously draw a fuck ton of attention, but there's literally no way the chopper wouldn't see it if it's still circling the area. So once we finally flick on the stage lights, the finale commences, and this is when shit gets good. The common complaint with this chapter is that you can just sit on these two towers here and hide for the entire finale, and to that I say, why? You like to have fun, right? Why don't you just do it on the stage, like the devs intended? Whatever, I'm not gonna talk about that shit. What I am gonna talk about, though, is the music. You see, Valve didn't just make a fake band and then use an actual song for the concert. They made an entire rock song with multiple stages just for this one fight, and it is, without a doubt, one of the best songs in the entire game. I'm gone, but I can be a lifetime, honey. In the end, though, after the normal finale song and dance with the tanks and the hordes, the chopper finally arrives and I managed to get out with the gnome in hand. Coach wasn't so lucky, though. All in all, I really enjoyed this campaign. Sure, Chapter 3 was certainly a low point, but everything else was still really good. Then, it does have my boy Gnome Chompscan in. Even if the rest of the campaign absolutely sucked ass, I'd still probably give it a 3 out of 5 just for him alone. But with everything else around it, I'm gonna give this one the first perfect score of a 5 out of 5. Congratulations, everyone, you have been Gnome-pilled. Since we're playing Left 4 Dead, the helicopter that we exfilled on crashes somewhere in the swamps of Louisiana, kicking off the campaign of Swamp Fever, our 10th campaign. The first chapter is Plant County, and this one starts off in front of this abandoned gas station. With nowhere to go, we decided to start heading deeper into the bayou, eventually ending up at the small little town. Small little town, what the fuck am I saying? Which is referred to as Earl's Gator Pond on the wiki. Here we can find this lever that allows us to bring a ferry over to the other side of the shore. Obviously, pulling the lever starts a crescendo event, which is pretty fun. And after the ferry arrives, we can ride across the river and head even deeper into the bayou. If I'm being honest with you, this is what most of this campaign is. Just wandering through these swamps with almost no real objective. As far as I'm concerned, there's no real other focal point in this chapter, so I'm just going to skip to the next chapter, which is aptly named The Swamp. And as expected, this is where the campaign takes a turn directly into Swamp Town. The first, like, 30% of this chapter is just swamps, but eventually, though, we do reach this downed plane. This is the best part of this chapter, hell, maybe even the best part of this campaign. We have to breach this door to get out onto the other ring, which will allow us to get to the safe room. Breaching the door will kick off another crescendo event, which is actually pretty fun. Eventually, after traversing through another section of swamps, we can reach this small road here where I ended up encountering a tank, who nearly bodies Nick, but we managed to pull through. After that, though, we can reach the safe room, ending the chapter. The next chapter is the Shantytown, and tonally and stylistically, this is easily the best map in the campaign, mainly because it's set in an actual fucking place, not just the swamps. Hey, did anyone else notice that swamp counter thing going up in the corner? That's probably not important. You have to lower this little plank using this lever, and somehow, for some reason, this one plank lowering makes enough noise to summon a horde. Why? Because fuck you. That's why. The only real other notable thing that happened to me in this chapter was the wedge encounter near the safe room. Thankfully, Rochelle, with her infinite wisdom of her goo goo gaga ass baby brain, ended up startling the witch, then being downed by said witch, and also died to her. Thankfully, when we make it to the safe room, which was right around the corner, might I add, Rochelle re manifested to the ghost of Swamp is past. What? Why does that one- you know, whatever. The finale of this campaign is the plantation, and this is easily the hardest one in the entire game. At least for me. It was so hard that I ended up having to take a break and get on a day later and finish this chapter specifically, which is why I'm playing as Ellis rather than Coach in this footage. The first of the finale's many, many problems is the fact that it starts out in this area with houses, which adds at least another four or five minutes of gameplay until you actually reach the plantation itself. The house itself is pretty nicely designed, but most, if not all of the main supplies spawn downstairs on the first floor. 
Meanwhile, there's a mounted machine gun up on the second floor balcony overlooking the hedge maze. This really isn't a problem since the MG on the balcony isn't all that great to use anyways, but it's just mildly annoying. You know, there's a cool machine gun right there, I want to use it, but best strategy is to sit next to the door, but whatever. The real shit starts when you call in for a rescue. The guy on the radio is named Virgil, who might be the biggest G in the entire game. You'll see why in a bit. We tell him that we're at the plantation and he begins his journey. On my winning attempt, my plan was just to sit around near the gate and let the infected funnel towards me from three directions. With my three teammates clumped up in this section, the hordes of common infected and special infected were pretty easy to deal with. The first tank went down easy too, he didn't even manage to down anyone. The real shit starts after the second wave of the infected. You see, this is the only finale in the game that forces you to fight two tanks at once. Sure, every campaign spawns multiple tanks, but that's once the escape vehicle actually arrives. This one, on the other hand, spawns two in the second tank wave. This might not seem like a problem, I mean, only one tank is usually pretty straightforward, but no. This part caused me just so much grief. I died on this part like at least eight or nine times, but on the final attempt where I sat at the gate for 90% of the finale, I finally managed to pull it off, at the cost of my entire team, of course. I know that was a bit of a messy strategy there, but if anyone finds a better one, don't tell me, because not only do I don't care, but I will be unbelievably angry if anybody tells me how to do it. Regardless, with the one able-bodied survivor on the boat, Virgil pulls away and I escape mostly unharmed. At least physically, that is. All in all, this is probably my least favorite campaign of the Second Survivor's Crusade. The first few chapters are kind of samey gameplay-wise, with the only moments of no being the downplay in the section in the shantytown, but other than that, most of this campaign is pretty easy. With the exception of the finale, which is just brutally hard and honestly a ridiculous gameplay spike, even just for one minor change in the second tank phase. Eh, highest I can give this one's a 3 out of 5. Not bad, but not great either. With the survivors, or if survivor, now in Virgil's boat, you'd think that things would be pretty hunky-dory and we can just drift out onto sea, but you'd be wrong. Of course, Virgil's boat is running low on gas, so we're forced to head ashore and get a bit of marine fuel. Virgil drops us off at the docks near a gas station and tells us to signal him with the flares in the gun bag when we get the gas. Only problem being that Nick's dumbass forgot the gun bag on the boat, meaning that we have no way of actually signaling Virgil when we find the gas. We also don't have any high-powered weapons to start off with either. Thankfully though, this fast food joint near the gas station has a fuck ton of supplies in it, way more than usual actually, including a bunch of throwables and even a hunting rifle. You'll see why the game gives us all this firepower here in a bit. Unsurprisingly, the gas station doesn't have the gas that we needed. If it did, the campaign would be 50 seconds long and we'd already be on our way to New Orleans. The sign outside says the nearest gas station is nearly two miles away. The first chapter is called Milltown and it's pretty good. This entire campaign feels like an apology for the last one. Since it's pretty straightforward, nicely designed, and doesn't require us to jump around and waste high water, which was a criticism that I forgot to bring up during my Swamp Fever chapter, but I am bringing up now. Regardless, this entire chapter mainly entails us traversing through this small suburban town, which is pretty nicely designed. There's a yard sale, a playground, and even a treehouse. It's neat, but eventually we reach the safe room and end the chapter. Chapter 2 is called The Sugar Mill, and it might be one of my favorite chapters in the game. It starts out unassumingly enough, just sending us through some empty buildings, but the real shit starts once we get outside. You see, in the lore, witches are supposed to be attracted to sugar. Something about it just seems to draw them in, and obviously a sugar mill full of sugar would be a surefire place to find a bunch of witches. And lo and behold, here they are. Most of the witches here are roaming around and pretty easy to avoid. My team even managed to get out unscathed, but even if I managed to take care of things smoothly, this area was really intense, it's actually pretty cool. After we clear out the mill, we can reach these concrete ruins, which has an elevator that allows us to get out to the field and eventually reach the gas station that we've been searching for. Calling the elevator starts a crescendo event, summoning a wave of the infected. After the elevator finally arrives, we can ride it down into the field, which is also full of witches that have been camping around in it. This part is back to being tense, and it's also pretty cool. But after we're done with that witch chicanery, we can finally reach the gas station, where we can stock up on ammo in the safe room, as well as grabbing four cans of gas each. Now, however, we have to make the return trip, which is a first of the game. This is why the levels so far have been absolutely packed with supplies, to accommodate for our return trip. The title of this campaign also finally rears its wet, slimy head, as the rain finally starts to pour. And around here, when it rains, it pours. This obviously makes things more difficult. Not only does it make visibility bad, but it also makes things almost impossible to hear, which is almost as detrimental as not being able to see. This helps make the trip back not feel like terrible padding, since most of the levels are now beginning to flood with rainwater, making movement kind of a pain in the ass. Thankfully, at least in the return to the sugar mill, you can use these elevated platforms to avoid the water, and all of the witches have despawned since our last time here as well. Around one of the main mills, I ended up encountering a tank, which is a rather nerve-wracking encounter, not only because of the fact that it was pouring, but also because of the fact that it nearly managed to kill Rochelle in his short lifespan. But besides the near-death experience for Rochelle, everything went down pretty smoothly. After we make it back to the Chapter 2 safe room, we can begin heading back to the fast food joint we started out at. 
This chapter has a new and exclusive save zone, which basically only exists as a buffer zone between this chapter and the finale. Speaking of the finale, the finale is set at the burger tank that we started at. Without any flows to signal Virgil, you might be thinking that this is it, but Coach recalls the story of being able to see a burger tank sign through some pretty thick fog, and he decides that that's the best course of action. So, we turn on the burger tank sign to help Virgil find us. When we turn it on, the finale begins, and I have to say it's fine. It's not as fun as the Dark Carnival one, and it's not nearly as hard as the Swamp Fever one, but that's fine, I guess. There's no other real strat other than just to sit up on the roof of the entire thing, but it's still a decent time. After the usual song and dance, Virgil makes his way back and everyone makes it out in one piece. Overall, this campaign was pretty damn fun. It tried something to do with the backtracking, and I personally believe that it nailed it. It's a nice refresher when compared to the kind of awful swamp fever. I'm gonna give this one a 4 out of 5. Anyways, after a while, Virgil and the gang finally arrive at New Orleans. Virgil wishes us luck as he parts ways for good, heading off to help other survivors. You know, Virgil really was the MVP of the group. Not only did he manage to help us extract, twice, he was also just generally a pretty nice guy. Considering how long he spent with carriers, the likelihood is that he is also a carrier. Or maybe he just is the boat, I don't know. The first chapter is the waterfront, and it's a pretty good time. Our main goal is to get to a military extraction point on the other end of this bridge. Right off the bat, this campaign sets a pretty drastically different tone when compared to the others. The city of New Orleans is basked in sunlight, which is a nice change of pace when compared to the dark and gritty palette of the previous two campaigns. In terms of gameplay, we get introduced to another uncommon infected type here, the Riot Cop. They're kitted out in head-to-toe body armor and can soak up an infinite amount of damage from the front and can only take damage from their unarmored back. The AI bots don't seem to know this though, since they just dump ammo into their body armor without a care in the world, which is a little annoying. In terms of level design, this campaign is pretty damn fun. The city of New Orleans is honestly kind of beautiful, even if the waves of infected in the military beginning to bomb the place to the ground really does put a damper on that. Still though, Chapter 1 is pretty simple, other than Nick getting murked by a witch near the safe room. After reaching the safe room, we can enter into the next chapter, the park, which actually starts at a park. The park doesn't have a cool bride witch, but it's still pretty good. Once we get through the park, we can reach the cedar truck, which leads into a sort of evacuation center. Now, the only way to get through to this area is by closing a rear door on the truck, then opening the side door, allowing us into the fenced area. Only problem being that opening the side door starts a gauntlet crescendo event. This part entails our team, and by our team I mean me, running to the center tower here, which has a button that turns off the alarm on the truck. Overall, this part is pretty easy. All of my team even managed to survive this in one piece. After that, the safe room is pretty much just right around the corner. The next chapter is the cemetery, and this one starts off in a not-cemetery, but rather in the small suburban area, where I had one of my few non-crescendo event-related deaths in the entire playthrough. A smoker managed to grapple me and get me pinned around a bunch of common infected. After that, my team didn't end up getting me out in time, and then I died. Then Rochelle went down, and basically everything fell apart from there on out, but I was already restarting at that point. After a second attempt that went down without a hitch, we made it through this underpass, which is packed with alarm cars, which is a little annoying to navigate. But eventually, after some mishaps in the underpass, we can finally make it into the cemetery, and this is where this chapter basically peaks. This is one of the few areas in the game that the AI director can directly change, as the path through the cemetery changes with every playthrough. Still, after clearing a path through the cemetery, we can finally make it to the safe room, after one of the most eventful chapters in this campaign. The next chapter is The Quarter, in reference to New Orleans' French Quarter, and this is a pretty fun chapter. The most notable part of this chapter is this crescendo event, which involves moving a Mardi Gras parade float into place, allowing us to get to this adjacent building here. After that, it's basically just one long combat gauntlet until we can reach the safe room of the finale of the game, the bridge. After grabbing some weaponry and first aid from the safe room, we can walk out into the bridge where we can find a dead guy with a radio, which allows us to contact the military at the other end of the bridge. The guy on the other end is surprised to hear from anyone on the bridge, but they agree to send a chopper down to the opposite end of said bridge. They also ask a bunch of questions about us being infected and such, and the radio operator tells the chopper pilot to prepare for carriers. When we're done talking with Papagator, we can lower the bridge and begin our final crusade. The chopper will only stay at the other end of the bridge for 10 minutes, so we have to move fast. This is by far and away the most unique out of all the finales in the second game. The first game had the sacrifice, this one has the parish. This is easily my second favorite finale in the game, between Dark Carnival and the sacrifice. The premise seems pretty straightforward, just get to the end of the bridge, but this one is actually pretty damn tough. Without any wiggle room to avoid the infected, as well as the many, many tanks on this bridge, this finale is really damn hard. Not as difficult as the Swamp Fever finale, but it is pretty challenging. Thankfully, the bridge has plenty of weapons and healing items just lying around, which makes things mildly easier. But finally, after getting through the gauntlet of fire, we can reach the end of the bridge where the chopper is waiting. Coach, Nick, and I manage to make it to the chopper while Shell takes one for the team and gets the shit kicked out of her by a tank while the rest of us escape. And as we fly off, the bridge gets destroyed and the credits roll. Overall, I'd say it's worth about a 4.5 out of 5. Which overall nets the Left 4 Dead 2 Survivors campaigns a 24.5 out of 5. I may be a bit biased in that because I just like the Left 4 Dead 2 Survivors a little bit more, but still, the whole game is great. 
In the end, our survivors are likely put into military custody for the time being, meaning that a sequel involving them is pretty unlikely, but not impossible. Honestly, it would be pretty sick to see these guys come back in Left 4 Dead 3 as a cool fucking infected cleaner squad or some shit, I don't know. It, I'm just spitballing here. This game is awesome, though, even if they don't come back. But then again, knowing Valve and their general slump towards making things that don't have the number 3 in the title, that is pretty unlikely. But that's it. That's Left 4 Dead. Overall, this playthrough reinforced my already existing beliefs. This game is a masterpiece. Anyways, thanks for watching. I know this video is just obscenely long, but thank you for sticking around and watching the entire thing if you got here. Or even if you just skipped to the end to see this part for some reason. Anyways, next time I'll do something that isn't this absurdly long and time-consuming to make.